Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Welcome back, friends, to another episode of Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. This is a Catholic variety program broadcasting on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio in Jackson, Michigan, and I am your host, Philip Campbell. I'm so pleased that you've decided to tune in again to Faith Matters. Now, if you've been Catholic for any length of time, if you've had any exposure to uh, to Catholic piety and devotional art, you've you've undoubtedly run across icons and and iconography, once associated in the past very much with uh, with the East, with Eastern Christianity. In more modern times, love and veneration of icons have spread throughout the West and the whole Universal Church to where now most of us have been exposed to icons. We probably have our own uh, our own favorite icons. Uh, in my own home, I have the uh, I have a, a Christ Pantocrator icon, and I have the San Damiano cross, which is a the cross associated with Saint Francis that's that's painted in the traditional uh, iconographic <laughs> iconographical uh, format. So we're we're probably very familiar with seeing these things. Um, today we're going to talk all about iconography with a friend of mine, uh, Donna Nelson. Donna uh, has such an interesting story. She's, uh, she's a Catholic wife, homeschool mother of, of two, who resides in Ann Arbor. And uh, God really used her, her passion for sacred art and, and beauty to, um, to really unfold a beautiful little ministry that she has. Through the, through the influence of a friend, uh, Donna's family was introduced to icons of the Eastern uh, Byzantine tradition, and uh, Donna uh, took a workshop uh, with no previous experience in, uh, in, in art or anything like that. Um, took a workshop on uh, creating icons and uh, ended up loving it. And she's continued over the years to, to write icons under the study of a Byzantine Catholic priest, Father Marek uh, Wisnowski. And so she spends her free time writing icons, and her iconography over the years has grown into a, a prayer card ministry with images of her icons that are shared uh, all over the world, including places like Fatima, uh, Italy, Africa, and, uh, and even Haiti. So it's a, uh, it's a very lovely story, and uh, Donna, I should have been letting you say all that instead of me, but it's just such a, a cool story. So welcome to the program, Donna. Thank you, Phil. It's good to be here. So, um, first of all, uh, I guess icons are interesting. We all we all know what an icon you know an icon when you see it. But what is what is the definition of an icon? If you had to explain it to someone who'd never seen one, what's an icon? What are they used for? Yeah, sure. Um, so the word itself, icon, comes from the Greek word, um, but that's spelled a little different than we know it. It's spelled E I K O N. And that word means image. So the icon is an image, and in the sacred tradition, it's an image of veneration of a holy figure. Um, so typically you would um, see, uh, whether it's a saint or a Christ or the Virgin Mother, um, angels, and they represent this beautiful uh, heavenly realm, uh, an atmosphere, so to speak, of prayer. And it brings the person to contemplate the person that's represented in the icon. Um, and it's a visual expression. Um, it's rooted um, in classic Greek and Roman art, and it's, a, it's an expression, actually, of the Word of God. Um, it's, it transmits two realities, the reality of God and that of the world. Um, there's numerous different icon styles. There's the Greek, the Russian, mm -hmm. Coptic. And um, the most historic examples um, that you were f referring to, most people recognize them as, as these paintings on wood. But um, several other images are painted um, on frescoes. Um, you, would, you would notice them in mosaics embroidery, even tapestries, and precious mem uh, metals. Um, so um, the icon actually is just this reference point to the scriptures and to God. Um, and, and just like how we have photos of family members, 
um, to remember them. These icons are there to help us acknowledge the constant presence of Christ and the saints in our lives. Right, they're sometimes referred to as windows into heaven. Correct, exactly. Now, um, so they're, they're like a meeting place with God. Mm. Uh, that's why they refer to them as the windows into heaven. That's a place, a sacred place where we encounter Christ. Now, what is the, um, what is the history of this, uh, this sacred art? Yeah, so um, the sacred art goes back um, over 2,000 years ago, um, and it really takes us back to Genesis 127, where God created man in his image, in the divine image he created him, mm-hmm. and then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the, the incarnation has everything to do with why we have iconography, um, it, had Christ not come into this world, then we wouldn't be able to portray this image of him, but he, he left his image with us. So that being said, 2,000 years ago, the early Christians who were persecuted, and they hid in the catacombs, and they were praying, and they painted on the walls various images that represented um, Christian beliefs. And they left these lasting imprints in those images for the new Christians to understand the faith mm-hmm. and for all to see. Um, they kind of served as a medium for the uneducated, um, because a lot of people at that time, of course, were not literate. So they used these images to teach the faith and as a means to prayer. And then as we move out of the, the persecution into the Middle Ages, these, these images move into liturgical worship into the the churches, and especially in the East, you see them becoming very much an integral uh, integral part of the Eastern liturgies. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, if any one of us would enter into an Eastern Rite Catholic Church or an Orthodox Church, we would, of course, see the large iconostasis that separates the Holy of Holies with separate the altar from the people, and it has all the icons displayed on it. Now, um, interesting, you, you're mentioning Christ becoming flesh. I'm, uh, I'm thinking of the, the passage in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says that he, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, and in the, the Greek translation, the, the word St. Paul uses is the icon, that Christ is the, the icon of of the Father, and this is why there was this controversy in the uh, in the late uh, the late early Church, uh, like the the seventh eighth centuries, over the propriety of displaying images. Because of course we know in the Old Testament, graven images were forbidden. But what the Church eventually decided was that that situation had changed with the New Testament because the invisible God had become flesh. When we see Christ, we're seeing the icon or the image of God. And so, can you tell us a little bit about this this period? Uh, there's a period, uh, there's this, this movement called iconoclasm, where the Church was really sorting out the place of sacred images in worship. What was iconoclasm? Yeah, so um, the iconoclasm, um, first, just looking at the word, iconoclasm, that means Mm icon-breaking. And the iconoclasts, as they were called, were the icon smashers. Mm. So this was this brutal reaction against icon painters and and icons. And it happened around 726 A.D. with Emperor Leo III. And he issued this series of edicts against the veneration of these sacred images, and <clears throat> so what happened was um, the, the Christians that were venerating these icons were killed. The icons were destroyed. Um, there were countless numbers of icons within the churches that were whitewashed, that were broken, that were burned and destroyed. And what many might not know about the iconoclasm period is that many priests and many monks and, and artists actually, were tortured and killed. Many of them, they took the icons themselves and and hit them to their death, actually, with 
um, these icons, these sacred images. Goodness. Um, much like the martyrs defending, you know, Christ, they were defending these sacred images and they were, they were killed. But thankfully, um, that finally ended in the year 843. So, uh, and they actually, if I recall, they, they actually had summoned an ecumenical council over this in, in 787. Yeah. I think Second Constantinople, where you have a formal, uh, yep. a, a beautiful definition of the Church's veneration of images that says, drawing on the work of St. John Damascene, he who venerates an icon or an image venerates not the image, but the individual represented by the image. Yeah, that's, that was exactly where I was kind of going with all of that as well. Um, that Seventh Ecumenical Council, which was around 787, um, that really um, talked about the use of icons, and it it uh, per- perfectly made it uh, okay then to use these icons once again in the church. It defined everything, and it said, okay, you you can go ahead and use these. Um, these are good. These are holy. There's nothing wrong here. And, and so um, that was a nice end to all of that. Now, do we know... Uh what I, is there an icon that's considered the first icon, or do we know, is there a, a, a founder of iconography, like the first iconographer? Do we know anything about this? Yeah, well, you know, tradition tells us, church tradition tells us that the first icon was called Not Made by Human Hands, and it was actually the icon of Christ himself, mm-hmm. otherwise known as what we would refer to as Veronica's Veil or... Some people call it Veronica's napkin. Right. Um, it was it was that piece of linen cloth, as we know, when Christ was going to his, his through his passion and death, that Veronica came and wiped his face. And what happened was, is his image, his face, was retained on that linen. Mm-hmm. And even at the Vatican, they still have that linen uh, um, contained there. I believe it's at St. Peter's. Um, and um, so that. Actually, Christ was the first icon. Um, it was his image. Um, there's also this other um, legend that I thought I'd mention, too, in the East, uh, more the Orthodox tradition. There's a story, it's a legend, that um, there was a king in Edessa. His name was King Abgar. And so that would be like modern-day Turkey. And um, this was nearly 2,000 years ago when Christ was alive. And uh, he got leprosy. He was very sick, um, near death. And he had heard of this wonder worker, Jesus. And he heard of all these healings of leprosy and all these other healings. And he wanted him to come, Jesus, to come to him and heal him from leprosy. So he sent his servant to Jesus and asked him to come to him. But Jesus couldn't go. So um, instead, Christ sent his apostle, St. Jude, in mm-hmm. his place. And so St. Jude brought back with him to the king this uh, cloth that had his image on it. And once he opened it up and showed it to the king, the king was completely cured of his leprosy. So he was healed completely but also there was a spiritual healing where he was completely healed spiritually as well, and he converted to Christianity, and so did then many under his rule at his palace. And um, this is why, like if you um, do a little Google search of the image of St. Jude, many times you'll see St. Jude with... Holding a face. Yeah. But it's got the face of Christ, and so that's the holy napkin, actually, of what he's carrying of the face of Christ. So that's that legend that's typically heard in the Orthodox and Eastern Rite Catholic. Now, you also have this, uh, this legend that, um, that St. Luke, the Gospel writer, painted icons of the Virgin Mary, and there's various mm-hmm. icons that are claimed to at least the originals uh, date back to St. Luke. Nobody, you know, we don't know for sure. But the point is this um, this goes very deep and very far back in the tradition of Christianity, uh, going back right to the very origins of the faith itself. Um, Donna, what are... So, icon, icons aren't just 
you know, they're not just these pictures. There's a certain stylistic element that we associate with icons as well, um, including the materials. What are some of the materials used in icons and why? Yeah, so there, there's the tradition um, with iconography to use all natural materials, you know, all natural that God had made. And um, the icon itself actually represents this transfiguration from dark to light, from, from sin to resurrection, uh, to grace. And, and it includes, um, with these materials, um, the iconographer would include all four different kingdoms. And the four different kingdoms would be, uh, number one, the vegetative kingdom. So here we would have the board itself, because it's made out of wood, the egg, because we would use egg tempera, um, the egg, and some pigments. Some of those pigment, pigments are, com- are from flowers. Um, so that would be the vegetative kingdom. The second kingdom would be the mineral kingdom, um, and that would be the paint pigments, too, that come from stone. And we also use, of course, gold for our halos and, and so on. And then third, we have the animal kingdom, and the animal kingdom would be um, even the hair on the brush. Mm-hmm. Um, we use rabbit skin glue to make the gesso. Um, and then the human kingdom, which is the icono- iconographer himself, and those then who will venerate the icon. So there's a lot of symbolism in all these materials that are used. Um, That's fascinating. So it sounds like the, the idea of the icon, it goes beyond just the icon itself into the materials that it's made out of, the tools that are used to produce it, and even the iconographer him or herself is all part of the is all part of the icon in a certain way correct correct yes it's very intentional um you wouldn't just use whatever i mean we've kind of i I do have to say um the traditional method is egg tempera and even before that they use like wax and caustics um now just because of ease and uh, it's just out of convenience a lot of iconographers will use acrylic, um, right. so it's not, you know, that natural um, element that we're talking about. But the most real traditional iconographers will adhere to those kingdoms that we, we spoke about. So it sounds like there's almost a theology behind icon writing. Is 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 that correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's because it's um, very Christological. There's a significance um, being very Christological, and the icon um, reminds us of God in whose image and likeness that we're created in. And so that theological significance of the icon speaks in the language of art and truth. You know, our, our, our Catholic truths are enwrapped in all of that, in Holy Scripture and in tr- Church tradition. Now, there is, um, it seems to me, that looking at icons, there seems to be a common, almost like a color palette that's used. Um, obviously, icons are known for being uh, flat or two-dimensional. Is there is there significance to that, the two-dimensionality or the the uh, the colors, the color choices? Yes, absolutely. There's there's a lot of significance to all of that. Um, so. They are two-dimensional images versus the normal paintings that we would see of three-dimensional images and even like our statues. They're flat images, and in contrast to the three, like a 3D painting where there's a vanishing point within the Mm -hmm. painting, with a two-dimensional image, um, you could take like Rublev's um, Trinity, which is a great way to understand this. The vanishing point is actually within us oh, wow. it's not in the painting it, it, it's out at us and so it's a reverse perspective and it, 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 it's significant theologically because it's God really looking at us and within us right and you so notice in, the- in, in almost every icon the, uh, the focus of the person in the icon is directed out at the viewer it's not, it's not supposed to be a naturalist a realistic 
depiction of a, a given story necessarily. You, you see the saint or Christ gazing outward at the viewer. It's supposed to be an encounter with the divine. Exactly. And so, um, you know, it's very purposeful. And even like you had mentioned, the colors, the colors, I'll just go through a few of them, but sure. there's really deep significance in these colors. So, so like, for example, you'll see gold and you'll typically see gilded gold leaf within the halos and other parts of the icon. The gold represents uncreated light, which is God, mm-hmm. and it's reserved for Christ. It symbolizes divinity. Um, white, for example, it, it symbolizes heavenly purity and divinity, but also innocence and holiness. You often see icons of the resurrection that show Christ in white robes or even uh, pulling on Adam and Eve from the depths. You will see that. Um, and that white is also depicted in like swaddling clothes of babies. So you'll see like in the icon of the nativity, you'll see Christ. Um, bound up literally in these swaddling co- clothes, um, and it actually represents his his shroud that he was buried in in death. Um, and purple, for example, purple in the Byzantine uh, time was a symbol of royalty. Um, it was expensive color, and um, in icons they represented Christ's kingdom. Um, in Christ the Bridegroom, that icon. That icon is of the moment when Christ was standing with Pontius Pilate, and he was looking out at the crowd, and Pontius Pilate said, Behold the king. Mm -hmm. And he had this purple robe that was on him. So it's a symbol, actually, of royalty of a king. Um, Red is used in icons to represent divinity. It represents love, passion, but also, of course, sacrifice. It's the color of the martyrs, it's the color of humility, and it's the color of blood. Um, Blue, uh, rather, that signifies the heavenly realm, um, the kingdom of God. Um, It also signifies humanity, um, truth, purity, and humility also. Green, um, in the Eastern Church... um, Green is typical of the Holy Spirit. Um, so on Pentecost, in the Roman Church, of course, you would see our priests dressed in red. In the Eastern Orthodox and the um, Byzantine Catholics, you would see them in green. Um, this color is about new life. It, it, it's about the plant world, mm-hmm. and it's used to portray youth and hope and where life begins. Yeah, so and even in the... Um even in the Latin rites where the vestments are red on that day, you'll still see a preservation of this custom in that, uh, at least in, in times past, it was common to decorate the church with all sorts of floral arrangements mm. on the day mm-hmm. of Pentecost uh, to signify the new life that the Spirit brings. Um, Donna, is there other... Uh, like It sounds like there's this set like canon of, I guess customs uh, as to how icons are, are written. Is there any other rules about maybe not just the, the color selection, but, but rules about iconography in general that are expected to be observed? Yes, absolutely. So you mentioned the colors. Um, and typically, um, an iconographer would adhere to these strict rules. And, and you would, re- like, if I'm going to uh, paint an icon of Christ, I would... Uh, I would research that icon, and I would fast and pray before I even get started. So that's part of the discipline um, of the iconographer before they even write an icon, but also during it. And um, we're not um, able to put, like, our interpretation into the icon. There's a strict adherence to tradition Mm -hmm. that has been passed down through the centuries, and we, you know, have to adhere to that as well. So, for example, um, I wouldn't put, like, an icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary and, and put a smile on her. So there would be, like, no expressions. That's a, that's a rule. You wouldn't They're put expressionless. emotion yep. into the icon. Yeah. Um, that's just one thing. I've heard, maybe you can clarify this. Uh, one of the most famous icons, one of my favorite, is Andrei Rublev's Holy Trinity, which depicts mm-hmm. an episode from Genesis where three three men or three angels symbolizing the Trinity appear to uh, to Abraham. 
I've heard that one of the rules in iconography is you don't depict God the Father, um, and that Rublev's icon is an exception because it, it's kind of God the Father symbolized as one of the three angels. But I, I have noticed I've never seen God the Father in an icon. Is that accurate? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think you're correct. I think the Trinity... Um, is about it, as far as I know. But yeah, but in the Trinity icon, the three persons of the Trinity all look like three three young men. They're like three angels, I think. Um, right. So they don't have the yeah. Western convention of like the Father as an old man and Jesus as Jesus and the Holy Spirit as a dove necessarily. They're just three identical individuals in that icon. Correct, and and they have three distinct um, characteristics about them. Um, it's also called the hospitality of Abraham, uh, right. which God the Father's. Anyhow, um, yeah, so they have three distinct um, characteristics, but yes, they're, they're meant to look the same because, as we know, the Trinity is one. Right. Um, Donna, so, I, no I noticed um, earlier you, you say um, that you write an icon instead of uh, painting it. Why, why do people say that you write an icon? Yeah, so um, icons are, are supposed to be understood in a manner uh, referring to Holy Scripture. So, you know, some people are really stringent about saying you write an icon. Other teachers, you know, might not be as stringent about that, but it, it comes with the truth of Holy Scripture and the tradition of the Church. So we would say we, we write an icon um, as opposed to paint an icon. It's different um, because it is sacred. Yeah, And it, it stems from Holy Scripture. Uh, we do have to wrap things up now, but uh, Donna, thank you so much for spending the time to, to educate us about uh, this very, uh, very pious and, uh, and fascinating subject. So thank you for being on the program. Thank you so much, Phil. It's good to be here. And thank you, uh, everybody out there, for listening. Again, this has been Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. Amen. Until next time.